Up until this point in time, we've been talking about data which are in this format. And we've assumed some general understanding of oh, common midpoint um, uh, data processing and so on. But just, just as kind of a brief background here, here is an ideal conceptualization of a common midpoint um, gather. We have sources and receivers on opposite sides of a equally spaced from a midpoint. Uh, midpoint in the gather, so we have a source over here, a receiver over here, um, centered about this midpoint. This common midpoint may be a common reflection point between layers I and J if the layer is flat. But if the layer is dipping, we know that these um, reflection points may walk up dip where they have to be corrected in order to um, uh, convert this into a common reflection point uh, data set. So we have increasing offset here, um, <coughs> source receiver offset. And if we come over here in this display, we're looking at um, offset distance uh, from the source to the receiver. So that would be these distances here, source to receiver at the longer offsets and near offset source and receiver. And we see a nice simple looking reflection from this layer, all of which we presume are coming from the same reflection point uh, between layers I and uh, J. Now, this reflection event in the common midpoint gather has a hyperbolic shape to it. So the travel times, and this is time in this direction, will increase with offset distance, so x. Now one of the reasons for collecting data like this is that we can sum them all together and get much, much higher uh, signal-to-noise ratio in our, uh, in our data. So this process of s summation has to be preceded by velocity analysis. We have to figure out what the uh, normal move-out velocity is. We have to correct it. And over here, what we have is a move-out corrected gather. All the events have been flattened out. They show up at the same time on the, this would be a two-way time, the time down and the time back up. <clears throat> and this would be the zero offset time. So it would be the time directly down to the reflection point and back up. So all these events are summed together to give us a higher signal to noise ratio in what's called the stack or common midpoint uh, seismic trace. So this summation process here is just a matter of summing all the traces in the gather together after they've been NMO corrected, normal move out corrected, to give us this single reflection event. Now notice that this time and this time and this time are all the same and they correspond to that straight up and down time. So that's why sometimes the, these traces are referred, referred to as normal incidents uh, or coincident source and receiver traces. So with that little bit of background, then we can take a look at uh, some real data. And you can see that uh, the real data does get quite noisy, quite complicated. We can see a nice reflection event in here. Uh, we do velocity analysis. We flatten out the reflections that we see up and down throughout the gather. We sum all the traces together in the gather. It could be any number of tra traces, 12, 24, 48, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> but just a large number of traces. They're all summed together, and we get a single trace from each one of these gathers after NMO correction and summation or stacking. And that's what we have over here is a stacked seismic section and we can see some diffraction events, some reflection events, some deeper faults down here that we have a bunch of refractions coming off of. So just this is what the geologists want to see. Uh, this is what they want to interpret. Of course, 
this data set would then have to be migrated. So here's perhaps a better look <clears throat> at um, stack seismic data. We can see two different displays here. This is a color density display. Um, we've got the black areas in here are positive amplitude. The reds are negative amplitudes. And we can see that we go from negative to positive to negative to positive to negative and so on. And over here we're looking at what's referred to as a variable area wiggly trace format. So these positive cycles are colored black and the negative cycles are colored at all. So we can see the kind of the up and down movement of the ground surface or the up and down acceleration of the surface, uh, which is telling us something about the uh, distribution of uh, mechanical properties in within the reservoir zone or in other zones of interest, as well as revealing some of the basic structure in the area that may be of interest to us. So these turquoise traces here are synthetic traces. So they're traces that are compiled from an estimated wavelet uh, convolved with uh, the reflectivity series, and the reflectivity is measured from well log data. So we would have a sonic log, a density log, we would calculate uh, reflection coefficients, and a synthetic may or may not have some uh, added uh, random noise. So this asterisk here represents the process of convolution, so we know that this is an integration process, and we're kind of setting the stage for working backwards from the seismic signal to the reflectivity and to the impedances. But this is kind of a general idea of the kind of data that uh, we're looking at when we refer to stack seismic data or common midpoint data and uh, so on. <clears throat> so now here's some more basic uh, background information here. The, the, remember that the acoustic impedance, Z, is just equal to a product of the density times the velocity, and this could be compressional wave velocity or shear wave velocity, compressional wave impedance or shear wave impedance that we haven't specified here, and the reflection coefficient between layers I and J, um, an overlying layer I, an underlying layer J, would just be the acoustic impedance or the product of the velocity and the density in the lower layer minus that in the overlying layer over the sum of the two um, impedances. And we can write this in an abbreviated form just using Z for acoustic impedance. So we have Z sub J minus E sub I over Z sub I plus E sub J. And um, this gives us the reflection coefficient. Now, when we're looking at data like this, we're thinking of it as normal incidence or coincident source and receiver. Um, source and the receiver in the same location. So the reflection events that we see are ones that come back from normal incidents on a subsurface uh, interface. Uh, so this angle here in this case is zero. Theta i is equal to theta r is equal to zero. Theta, the refraction angle, of course, would not be equal to zero. The amplitude ratio a sub r over a sub i would be equal to the reflection coefficient or the amplitude of the reflected uh, seismic event would be equal to the amplitude of the incident event times the reflection coefficient between these two layers. So this idea of the convolutional model, we have a seismic signal. It's a convolution of a wavelet with the reflectivity, and we may or may not add in noise when we're calculating the synthetic. We should keep in mind that the wavelets here are often several milliseconds in length. They could be 20, 30, 40 milliseconds in length, depending on the type of source that we use, the um, <coughs> dominant frequency, and so on. So we get a filtered view of the reflectivity. Now I've space the reflection coefficients kind of sparsely here just so we can see the superposition. But usually the reflectivity is going to be quite dense. And we'll, uh, it's often measured at about uh, half a foot intervals 
and so we'll see reflection coefficients basically every half foot. Now, the convolution process here, we have the signal convolution of this wavelet with this reflectivity sequence. And here we can see that each of the wavelets is scaled by the amplitude of the reflection coefficient. So the reflection from this interface has a much higher amplitude because the reflection coefficient is higher than does the reflection from this interface <coughs> right here, which is uh, has a negative polarity and a smaller amplitude. Now the duration of the wavelet doesn't change. Uh, for the small reflection coefficient here, the duration of the wavelet is the same as it would be for the larger reflection coefficient. And then this synthetic uh, in this convolution process here is basically a summation or a superposition of all the reflections from each of the reflection coefficients so that we get a seismic trace which is a superposition or a summation of the reflections from each reflection coefficient. So this one, these two negatives, the onset of the reflection from this interface is in phase with the follow cycle of the reflection from the layer above it. So they add to get together to give us an extra large reflection coefficient. These two events add together to give us a, a larger reflection event, and so on. So uh, this is composite here is basically a summation of the reflex, reflected wavelets from each reflection coefficient. So the normal incident synthetic seismogram, we've got a smooth sonic log over here, smooth density, got the acoustic impedance, and then we're calculating the uh, reflectivity. We can see we have a fairly, even here, a relatively sparse distribution of reflection coefficients. This is our seismic wavelet. In this case, it's been estimated from the seismic data. The seismic data in the vicinity of a well where these logs were collected, you can see, is quite noisy. There's a lot of noise in the, in the data in this case. So our synthetic looks very clean. We can see some similarity. We see a nice positive here associated with a positive there. You can see this event showing up in here, this event. This one's not too good, nor is this one. Pretty good association between these two positive uh, reflection events, and so on. And usually the differences that you see here, keep in mind that we're looking at the effects that we see in the gathers, the amplitude variations with offset when they're summed together are going to produce a different signal than we get simply from a normal incidence representation of the seismic signal. We'll have amplitude and phase changes with offset that are summed together. We also have Fresnel zone effects and we have uh, vertical interference, uh, vertical resolution limits uh, associated with the bandwidth of the wavelet that we're, we're using. <clears throat> so it's not surprising that we see rather significant differences quite often between the synthetic and the actual seismic data, including in this particular example, quite a bit of noise. So, And then we can compare the uh, positive polarity with the negative polarity. We see that the positive polarity gives us a, a much better match. So we're getting, um, we're tying ourselves at least into the geology. Uh, some of the details are off, but we're and matching up what we see in the actual seismic with our synthetic. So just as an overview of what we've gone through, we've taken a look at, uh, kind of reviewed this idea of the common midpoint gather where we NMO correct our, uh, uh, the reflection events uh, at different, uh, different offsets. We sum them all together. We get a higher signal to noise ratio event, you can see that common midpoint stacking does not eliminate all the noise, uh, but it does, it's much better than it would be if we were just using each individual trace separately. 
and um, our stack trace then would correspond to this synthetic over here or to the much noisier uh, data that we see in the uh, uh, actual seismic. So the next time we'll have uh, talk briefly about this idea of recursive uh, estimation of the impedance from the actual seismic data. So thanks for joining us and see you next time.